Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to talk about a big topic, hugely misunderstood I have to say, and that is regarding calories, fuels, and where it comes home to you is about bonking, hitting the wall, all as applied to cyclists. Now I have to say, there's a lot of misinformation around here, especially that put out by various companies producing, let's say, gels and supplements who want you to buy their exclusive product and I'm promising you various miracles. Hopefully we're going to cut through all that today and talk about some science informed stuff. Stuff? What stuff? Stuff is information that's going to improve your ability to understand how much energy you've got riding, how far you can go and when you're likely to get depleted, i.e. fatigued. Now, for some of you who are not into science and stuff, this is going to be a horribly complicated video. Some of you who are way into science, more than me maybe, this is going to be horribly simple. I'm going to take lots of shortcuts and you're probably going to hate it. But the bottom line is we're going to produce a calculator today that's going to solve a lot of problems. I was looking for a calculator out there that would answer some relatively simple questions about how much storage do we have, how much energy do, we, energy do we use at certain cycling speeds or powers? And to be honest, I couldn't find it. So in the end, I had to create my own. We've been somewhat helped here by our friends at cyclingapps.net because they're going to convert this to an app for us. But for now, let's get into the science of calories fueling. You know, what's this whole area informed by? So let me give you a few headlines at the start. Well, First, your body is super efficient at using fuels, yeah? Your body is super efficient. From an evolutionary point of view, it's very hard to lose weight. And if you eat unhealthily, you're going to put that weight on. And, you know, those little amount of calories will take you a long, long way. Here's, here's a pop quiz for you guys. How far could you ride on, let's say, one can of Coke? 330 mils, 139 calories. Come on, guys. How long could you ride on that? Let's say you're a recreational rider, your FTP is mid-table or low, 150 watts. How far could you go compared to a pro, 322 watts or neo pro, 350 watts FTP? Here's the headline. You could go about six kilometers or 12 minutes as a recreational rider, seven minutes as a pro on one can of Coke. What about if you called in KFC, three pieces of chicken, 700, 750 calories? That will get you about 32 kilometers or 60 minutes of riding as a recreational user. Okay, here's a big one. What about Christmas or Thanksgiving meal? Well, the stats show we tend to overeat. That's no surprise, but around about four to 5,000 calories on that major Christmas or Thanksgiving meal, which by the way, people often have every Sunday now. How far could you go on that? Any guesses, guys? Here's the answer. 220 kilometers. Did you notice that in the stats, guys, something very interesting was happening? The actual distance ridden was about the same for the pro and the recreational rider. And that's because laws of physics dictate moving an object, the bike and your body, over a distance is going to take a certain amount of calories. If, you're in, if you go faster, your intensity is higher, but you're on the road for a shorter period. So here's one of those quirks of calculations. And if you can't be bothered to sit through this video, I don't blame you if you can't. But I'll give you a takeaway that you can use for pretty much all situations. And that is the amount of work in joules, the amount of intake that you need to cycle a certain distance is pretty much linear, actually. And here's the rate, guys. Boom. It is one kilometer for every 100 kilojoules. Now, I know we're not all using kilojoules. If you remember, it's about four kilojoules for every calorie. But it turns out things aren't linear. They aren't linear because fitness improves so many things. It, inf it improves the energy efficiency of your body, how much energy intake you can convert to energy output. If you read online, people will say, oh, it's one to four. You can use a quarter of your energy intake as energy output. That would require a super fit person to use one to, one to four ratio, 25%. Most of us are using 15 to 20%, and that's built into our calculator today. Fitness also improves your storage, not so much in terms of fats, because you probably have a lot of more lean tissue, less body fat percentage, but in terms of carb, actually glycogen storage, particularly around the muscles. It also improves the switch point from carbs to fats. So at a certain point, your body, because it's getting depleted on your glycogen or carbohydrate stores, it switches to fats. And that is because you pretty much have an infinite amount of storage. Even lean individuals have a surprising amount of fat storage. Maybe 70,000, 80,000 of calorie equivalents 
in your body. So you can pretty much think of your fat store as infinite. So if you look online, there's a variety of calculators that are out there, but you know, pretty much they're not good calculators because they haven't personalized their calculation to your cycling ability, to your fitness ability, to your VO2 max, to your FTP, to your cycling duration, to your cycling intensity, to your personalized weight, for example. That influences your BMR, your basal metabolic rate. But yeah, I can break it down in terms of met cycling at certain miles per hour. And, you know, here's the graph. You've probably seen it all before. But that isn't that useful in effect. In fact, we have to really go into the science of energy systems in order to really crack this calculator and produce something that's much more accurate than just a simple chart on the net. So if you remember your body fuels, your body needs fuel for every process, you know, not just for exercising on the bike, but your skeletal muscle is rather like a factory where it converts energy into energy out. Energy in is the amount of energy you're consuming plus your storage, and energy out is the amount of power you're putting out, which is pretty much akin or correlated with your power on the bike. So if you've got a power meter, you've got an energy measure right there. And probably the power meter calculation, providing they're doing it correctly, is more accurate than I can produce on a calculator, you know, remotely here. But many people don't have that power meter or not reading it accurately, or there's some problems regarding its estimate. Like the Strava estimate is a rather rough estimate if you don't use a heart rate strap or you don't use a power meter. So very briefly, guys, just to go into the science, sorry if this bit is boring for you, but there's basically three energy systems. The creatine phosphagen system, which is short-lived but quite powerful. Your glucose, glycogen or glycolytic system. And your aerobic system, which is where those little miracle mitochondrial come in. Your aerobic respiration, which converts fat and glucose or glycogen into energy converting it to ATP or converting ATP to ADP you remember that from your science right so let's say you spin flat out for five six seconds what you're going to use is your immediate ATP stores that will give you about five percent of your energy you've got your CP system which will use about I mean give you about five, 50 percent of your energy and then the rest is made up with anaerobic effort right there which is quite powerful and anaerobic glycolytic system is definitely a powerful system Let's say you were to sprint for one minute, then you'd be using anaerobic for about 50%, aerobic glycolytic, you know, glycogen breakdown for about 50%, 50-50. But let's say you were to go an hour of power, like Bradley Wiggins' hour record, what would happen there? Well, there you'd be using aerobically fat breakdown for about 10%, and you'd be using aerobic glycogen breakdown for the remaining 90%. But here's where things get really interesting, guys. The switch over from carbs to fats is not a fixed place because your body actually preferentially wants to use, use carbohydrates. Now, of course, although fats are more energy dense per gram, actually, if you look at it per oxygen molecule used or per litre of oxygen used, it turns out that carbohydrates are the more efficient system. If you work it out from the laws of physics, this formula is fixed, by the way, Glucose oxygenation to energy or heat would produce 21.1 kilojoules for every liter of oxygen consumed, whereas fat oxygenation produces 19.6 kilojoules for every liter. What that means is there's a 1 to 1.5 kilojoule difference, or to be more exact, a 7.6% difference between using glucose or glycogen as fuel and fats for fuel. Which is why, although you've got a near infinite supply of fats, your body actually wants to use carbs because the difference in that seven to eight percent is like the difference between being on the podium for the Tour de France and being mid pack. Or, sorry to bring this into it, the difference between being on EPO and not using EPO. So that's a huge difference in that eight percent. Is a bit like if fat was in your car, fat would be diesel fuel, whereas carbs would be high octane fuel. Yes, we know fats are more energy dense, so you'd have to take in less volume of fat. So fats being energy dense provide roughly nine calories. I'm talking kilocalories here throughout this video. Sorry to be pedantic. I'll just say calories. Otherwise, I'm repeating myself again and again. Nine calories per gram. Protein itself produces four calories a gram, and you will use some protein stores. You will have some muscle breakdown, unfortunately, during an intense ride, but hopefully not more than 5 to 10% of your total energy needs. Carbohydrates, that's starches and sugars, are the least energy dense, by the way, providing just 3.75 calories per gram. 
Alcohol, by the way, is second most energy dense. If you want to fuel your ride on alcohol, you'll get seven calories per gram, which is <laughs> a crazy idea Please right there. Jace, come on. Right up, bud. <laughs> yes, yes, he's going. I'm coming, I'm coming. <laughs> But of course, the problem is we don't have great storage of all of these. So if you want to have a look at this chart, you'll see, you know, you've got blood glucose, which is immediately available. You've got liver glycogen, which you can metabolize, but probably is only about four to five hundred calories storage. The predominant glycogen or carbohydrate storage is in your muscle. And the fitter you are, the more this will go up. And it's around about fifteen hundred to two thousand. On the fat side, you've got your serum or plasma free flatty. I mean, fatty, what's flatty? Fatty acids. You've got your serum triglycerides and also you've got a bigger store of muscle triglycerides. But your huge store is in adipose tissue, which you break down by lipolysis, 80,000 to 100,000, depending on your body weight. Okay, an easy way to look at this is to say as a rule of thumb, and by the way, our calculator is a lot more accurate than this, but as a rule of thumb, a typical person has around 100,000 calories, of which 74,000 are in fats, 24,000 are in protein, and only 2,000 or so are in carbohydrates. And when your carbohydrate stores are depleted, you're going to basically, in quotes, bonk or hit the wall. Now, that's not a switch. You don't suddenly run to zero. What actually happens is your body runs low on fuel, on glycogen, you're starting to metabolize more fats and your body's protesting, your body's saying, hey, what's going on here? My glycogen's nearly depleted. Go easy, go slower, slow down. And of course, that represents to you getting weaker or less motivated. So when they say hitting the wall, they really mean getting weaker and weaker until your motivation is so depleted you can't carry on without refueling. Now, when that exact point is, you're going to have to look at our calculator. And I might as well introduce this now. So here is the calculator, guys. So let's have a look at this calculator together. This has been the product of several weeks work and working intensely behind the scenes to bring this to you. There's quite a lot of complex calculations going on in this calculator, but I've managed to simplify into what I think is the most user friendly version. And we're putting this out there today. See the links below. So why don't we have a quick look at this together, guys? So basically, this is our pacing, fueling, bonking calculator, and it will enable you to work out your nutritional requirements for pretty much any race. Yes, any length of race and any ability is better here if you can work in you can work in watts or you can work with speed. But if you can work in watts and if you can work in duration, you know, if you put in your duration of your planned event, it will make the calculations a lot more accurate. So here I'm putting in, you know, FTP 277, planned event time 188. Now you can change the units, but like I say, this will help with the calculations. And you can see here, if I put in these requirements, it's telling me straight away that my pace is too high. If I want to run that pace and stay within my nutritional requirements, I'm going to run into problems. I'm going to have a high carbohydrate depletion. Now, I can work out what benefit I get by putting in supplement intake into this box here. So I can put in, let's say, 66 grams an hour or higher. I'm going to probably keep that fixed at 99. It's not really recommended to take more than 90 grams an hour. Otherwise, you're going to have to take loads of water and you're going to get overhydrated. We'll talk about hydration in a future video. Now, you can work in speed. Here's an example. You can change the metric from watts to speed you can put in your average speed so for ftp you would put in your average speed over like roughly an hour and then you put in your event speed and it will work out again whether you're going to be able to get to the end of that event at that speed so for example 44 kph you can work in imperial if you want 41 it's saying yeah my my pace may be can may be achievable but it's likely i'm going to run into trouble and it will actually give me a suggestion on um, suggested speed. So here it's saying, reduce your speed to 42 if you want to get to the end of that event with your fuels intact, i.e. not totally depleted. Look what happens if I change the event time, you know, does a calculation on the fly and it's telling me I need to reduce my speed. It gives me a suggestion. Now, if you try and keep your planned pace box and also your fatigue bon bonking risk box both in the green, then there's a higher chance that you're going to be able to finish the race. But for sure, you can tweak your intake 
So you can go back to that carb supplement box. So here I'm putting in an alternative value. I'm saying if I was to take in 66 grams of carbohydrate per hour, which is not necessarily an easy feat, and to reduce my speed to 31 kph, then would I make it to the end of the event? Would I be likely to make it based on my pacing calculation? And the answer is probably yes. Now in our suggestions at the bottom of the sheet there, that is the suggested maximum speed to get to the end of the event. But you might well decide on a more cautious speed. That would be totally reasonable to do that if it was your first ride at that distance or if you weren't used to riding those distances. So although we're suggesting a maximum pacing speed or maximum pacing watts, feel free to ride on the day at a lower speed. Okay guys, apologies, that's been a super long video on nutrition, on energy, on storage, on bonking, on carbohydrate, on carbohydrate stores, on fat, on switchover value, on fitness and how that influences your fuel status. But we've ended there on what I think is a super useful tool because it enables you to plan for future events and plan pretty accurately. There's no absolutely accurate way of doing it because as you saw in the video earlier, certain variables are highly personalized and there's only so much I can do from a calculator. But I think if you play around with the variables, you'll be surprised how accurate this is. And we're doing a validation right now based on other riders who've given me their data. And hopefully I'll report back on that soon. And I'm going to leave you with one enduring image of what happens when you get your fuel calculation wrong, when your muscles are burning so much energy and you haven't got the fuels from your skeletal or liver supply or your adipose tissue. You know, your, the last part of your body to really be compromised is the brain. When your brain fuels are compromised and they cannot get enough fuels, you get poor coordination, you get delirium, you can't operate your muscles, you hardly know where you are. And that's exactly what happened to Jonathan Brownlee in the World Triathlon Championships. Did you see this footage? Wow, it's powerful, guys. So that's all for today. Fast fitness tips, bonking, fueling, nutritional calculator. Boom, guys. Give it a go. Until next time, have a great ride and stay safe out there.